there too. He's got my beer. Got my beer over here. I can't get out of here. Wish not yet, it's early. I know I was going. You came early for that. Hey, how are you? I have to, I'm like really mad. I came in here and set this whole thing up and somebody came in here and was watching, like some adult, obviously there's no kids, was watching YouTube videos. Oh, come on. And they disconnected my feed. That is ridiculous. That makes me really mad. Like, hello, let's be adults here. I got to like who's who's coming in here and doing that? Yeah. I need a I need a I need a No, no, I don't get it. right here okay that's good enough I just need an extension cord stay right in or wherever you want yeah huh? he's, he's got one Yeah, don't come back. Are you hungry? 
Hello, hello. Hey. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. So Zoe is taking the AP stock. Yes. She's, she's very focused on college. So. It's probably the pandemic thing. Yes, I know. Señora Rivera. Hello. Sí, mira, espérate. Sí, este mismo sirve.
that we're going to be using in this school and in the annex and all the schools in Elizabeth. And then I'm just doing kind of like a rock tell I talk. Uh, yes. The copies that you bring to me, because we don't need them yet. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, I've got this Q&A where you can ask me every question of the sun. I will answer it to the best I can. Um, if I can, we're all going to get used to saying, oh, I'm not sure about that. Let me check and I will get you an answer. Uh, generally speaking, uh, whenever you ask me a question and I don't know the answer, I'll use you, I will err on the side of caution. Uh, but we're going to spend a good bit of time on that today just so everyone understands what's being done in order to make sure that the school is safe uh, for all of us and for students. Then we're going to review plans for the first month of school, really going in depth mainly for the first week of school, but just to kind of get through uh, how it is we're going to reacclimate students to, uh, to a school environment. And then uh, the school district, uh, you know, as the normal procedure, is that the first day faculty meeting, the school district asks us to do our like policy review, which is that extremely lengthy document, that extremely lengthy two-page, nine-point font. So I'm going to review today. This is the, the benefits of no longer being a junior principal. When you get to be like, you know, when you've been principal for like 10 years, you're allowed your minor rebellions. So like, those policies that are most critical to the first day of school, um, I'll take the smallest slap on the hand that I'm sure I'll get, and then what we'll do is uh, we are going to cover the rest of the policies between the September and October faculty meeting. Because there are a bunch of policies that you do not need to urgently right now. So, that being said, uh, it's been a very, very busy summer. Um, we are going to do some catching up uh, but I, in a moment, but I do want to show over here. And there's a marker right above it. That's the parking lot. So if a question comes up during, you know, while we're here and you have a burning question asked, but it's not really on topic and we're not doing Q&A at the time, you can just go over and write it in the parking And I'll make sure either I'll get to it today or I will get you an answer for that question. Um, we're also going to do a report on teaching and learning and uh, then do kind of an in-depth review of that handout that's floating around. So with that being said, it's been a very, very busy summer. Uh, for everyone at Jack, let's just take a moment to like take it all in. Uh, so first, in the good news, is there were weddings. Congratulations, Carol. Somewhere, and I'm never going to get used to calling Natasha Mrs. Carter. I'm going to call her Marcy for the next 20 years. Because um, Natasha and I have to get longer than like any, me and everybody else in the building, but, uh, but Natasha will at some point, officially in the board, then be Natasha Carter. Uh, I don't think she's in the room right now, right? I think she, she should be off checking the schedule. But, uh, but, there was, but there was also Natasha. We also had uh, Patty Rose's daughter. Just got married just recently. Congratulations. <laughs> Mother of all, young man. And so then we had a lot of other things happen this summer. So just kind of as we kind of uh, checked in and had a chance to check in. Please just over Thank you so much. Um, as we had a chance to kind of check in with you, in fact, I had a chance to have one the other day with Anna Pacheco. I'm not sure if I heard me or how many folks remember Anna. Anna graduated. Was that in 2017? Sounds right. Uh, Anna had actually, um, she had a, she just recently graduated from NJCU, and she's been interning first, she's about to get hired at work. She told she's the only, she was in an honors program at NJCU. She told me she was officially the only person in that honors program who had dropped out of high school. Uh, because Anna at one point had dropped out, and then between our friend Don Libby, who is now the school district social worker. Uh, and Anna Palacio here, we were able to get her back into school, have her graduate in the most insane program of study I've ever seen a kid do in a year and a half to graduate. But she's ended up uh, doing extremely well in college and very happy for her. That's her goal. I am her intern. Uh, I I don't know where Mary is. Mary is somewhere. But Zoe Rivera finally had her thrice rescheduled week 15 party. <laughs> well, actually, it was actually supposed to be a sweet 15 party. And then after COVID, we just, they just decided, oh, that's into American Pie, like, in 2015. Um, 
Ellen Rodriguez joined the Air Force officially, looking very dapper in his uniform. He, he was that? Ellen. Ellen didn't do this, but I'm saying. No, no, no. Ellen's father, Ellen's father was deployed from back to high school. Ellen's father, I think, was in the National Guard, if I recall. But, um, but he looks great. He finished, he finished boot camp. Uh, I did send a message that, that I appreciate the fact that he did join the U.S. Air Force because roughly, I think when surveyed, 30% of Americans enter the Air Force to be the best in military service, and 70% are comfortable with being wrong. So I appreciate the fact that he made an excellent selection in, 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 in military service. I will say at the same time, down here, I don't know if you guys remember Eliana Venegas. Eliana can yeah. She's no longer Eliana Venegas because now she is Eliana. It's, it's actually Benelite because you have like married with kids in the Navy. Uh, just got, uh, she actually had gotten this award. Her mother had texted me over the summer. Uh, workforce of the two. I did well seeing her in the, in the Navy completely does not talk me uh, and doing well. Seeing her as like a mom, a married mom, that kind of stuff. But granted, she, she did graduate like seven or eight years ago, so it's it pretty incredible. We did have a chance to also welcome in person uh, the class of 2025, so we were able to do a welcome barbecue. The sophomores have not let me forget that we did not, we were not able to have one for them. So in that case, uh, because we were not able to have one for them, I've already told the sophomores, we are going to do some kind of social event before progress board, so it's about the next six weeks. We'll do some kind of social event for sophomores because they did not really have a chance to meet and get to know each other the way other classes do. So we won't make sure we have a chance to do that. It was great to actually meet the freshmen. Uh, we also had uh, I'm here, Matt may be watching on video, because Matt Montiello is a dad again. So Matt is on a very, very brief paternity leave for the next few weeks. We got a little content to with Matt a few weeks ago. <laughs> Matt is actually going to take a paternity leave later in the year. Uh, but he and his wife are getting, are getting ready to settle. Our Anna is back, and that is little Dion. So Dion is back from the Premier League, and Dion is doing very, very well. Uh, we also had, we were able finally to do some in-person graduations. So both, we were able to do both in-person graduations for the class of 21. We were also able to do a summer graduation uh, to dispatch those students. We had some students for whom uh, they were unable to graduate because they they had to complete their coursework for the summer and then they needed to do some independent studies. They needed to do some additional coursework. So we, because they could not walk into summer graduation, we were able to do a small private graduation here on this stage. Uh, with the next little Paris public with her mom, having finished very happily. Uh, so fortunately, we were able to get pretty much all of the class of 2021 through. There were a few who I was going to ask to return, uh, just because uh, because even with summer school was not going to be quite enough. Uh, so we made plans for them. Uh, oh, there's Marcus. Marcus got neutered. Marcus. It was time. It was time that the vet kind of said it was really important. So that's the moment of shame. That I would actually I'll note. That's that's Marcus on the way to get the clone team removed. So that's why he's happy. He was not happy for that two weeks of wearing the clone chain. I didn't realize how many how many like doorways there are in my house that you could like bump into. Really screws with the depth of that system. But uh but he's doing okay. Uh, and I will also we also had working up the summer. Uh Ms. Mara was here helping with everything more always, uh with a bunch of class photos that we have from over ten years. Uh, so more are going up, uh, and it's really helped a lot in the hallways. We did also, that right there uh, is a picture of uh, Jeff right after the flood. So you can't really tell, but there's like an inch or two of water on the floor. And there's our, our four pallets of brand new printer, which luckily got left on the pallets, saving the entire shipment of printers that are currently being installed in some of your classes. What dumb luck, but yeah. Uh, I will say, as many of you know, in Elizabeth, we have two schools, schools 26 and 27, uh, sustained pretty intense damage as a result of the storm. School 27 is, uh, I don't know what to call school, I meant to talk to Anna. School 26 is inside, is inside school 31, 
where myself and I know a few of us used to teach, those schools are offline at minimum from us. At minimum. Uh, there's at least one high school in North Jersey, I was speaking to the principal last week, who was offline for the year. But they're not. It's, it, those began is just too severe. So I will say it was not lost on the superintendent that bizarrely it seems that the oldest buildings in the school, in the school district, of which this is one, seem to have weathered the storm the best. And I will say that it partially, I believe, because we do predate the policy of like using the lowest bidder on a government contract. So you could totally get the contract because I'm like mobbed up local guy whose kids are going to come to this school. Uh, and at the same time, we were also between two world wars. So we had to, we to literally, this, this building was a fallout of shelter. It is prepared to take a nuclear blast. So at the very least, it was able to take the flood. I will say at the same time, uh, what, what I did see, it's that somebody saw last week we had a resource there uh, over at the main for the folks who were victims of the flood. We had several families that were like, displaced. Uh, some of you saw, I don't know if you, some of you may know Margarita Torres, the school social worker, who's a lovely person who I worked with years ago. Uh, had several family members pass away uh, in the flood. It was it absolutely devastated parts of the city. Fortunately, Union County and Essex County have now been included out of declared under FEMA as, um, as being eligible for federal aid. But I, I will say we had an incredible number of families uh, impacted. We also had an incredible number of former students volunteering as part of the city's COVID response force and the city's uh, flood response force. Because last week we had the resource there over the main, and everywhere I turned around, I, I like our end Derek Jennings, Derek Jennings was a city volunteer, Ashley Pereira was a city volunteer, so I hardly was a city volunteer. Uh, I know Jen, uh, Jennifer Largo, who's now at Montclair, is on their, is on their COVID response team at Montclair as part of Maricor. Uh, so there's been an incredible amount of work happening all over the city uh, in order to help families in the flood, and a lot of deaf teachers, deaf alums have been helping. And I will say at the same time, because I already made that collage picture, and then last night, Eric and I were up to, and I was not going to redo that whole collage at, at midnight. Uh, but we actually had a summer live performance. Uh, Somewhat, <laughs> because what we actually had was our summer walking the beat partnership, which is our, our theater partnership, which is a partnership between the Elizabeth Police and our students, actually produced a show on this stage, recorded it. Uh, Adler LaFleur, for some of you remember Adler, Adler uh, did the video editing uh, for, for the production, and they had a premiere last night on the steps of City Hall, and they set up kind of an inflatable screen. Uh, across the street, so we're able to do a live viewing. The cast did a great job, uh, and they're very happy. We're very happy to be able to actually have some degree of a live theater experience, even in the midst of COVID. So it was a pretty busy summer, guys. Uh, there was definitely a lot happening. We had other summer happenings. So, as many of you know, our friend Matt Long uh, was promoted to be the English supervisor to fill the very large shoes left by Ray Fabiano. Uh, so, Ned is off. Being Ned, doing his thing, doing his thing next door. Um, I don't know. I do not think that wing of FJC was was ready for that level of energy. Um, normally, that floor of FJC is a very quiet place, or at least it was. Um, so uh, Ned there, I did mention Don Lippy is now uh, uh, is now our school district social worker uh, to replace Lucy Hernandez, uh, who had retired, who was a psychologist who retired several years ago. Uh, and we also have a number of friends um, who have moved into different positions. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, just because of the shift to the eight period day, because of the shift to the eight period day and the opening of the new high school, it, it, it created some movement among some faculty. So, uh, unfortunately, I mean, um, it's fortunate that they have jobs where the folks could have been with, uh, but, it, but they, they did end up having to move into different positions. Stephanie Roman. Did have to move into the new STEM Academy, and Louisa Valente had to move over to what is formerly St. Jen's, what is now the FJC ninth grade annex, which we will talk at some point this morning about why FJC is a ninth grade annex and where FJC that is an irony that has not been lost on the coming to myself. Uh, 
But in other general updates, one I did forget to include there, and I did not get a chance to sell Sandra and Erica and Kelly and everyone, but our new important part of the using computer today. So who to them? They will come in next week. Our new curtains. Our new our, our 1994 Air Force. It's a week to get done, but but those are officially coming in. That work does have to be done while students are in the building. But uh, but actually that, that work is, is ready to go, so they'll be coming in uh, probably next week in order to do the installation. Uh, but we do have other things happening facilities wise and IT wise. So some of you saw we do have new printers going into classrooms. Uh, we do have new boards, new interactive device boards, something like what we have in the apps going into our classrooms. Just because they can be a little bit quirky, uh, I did sign us up to be towards the last people to get them, just to kind of let the school district work out the case uh, in other places. Uh, so that they'll end up coming in, I, I think, I mean, I like our Star Wars, I think they were fine, but this is an update in technology uh, that will allow teachers not only to have a wireless keyboard, an interactive board that you can actually like, manipulate from around the part of the room, and also, I think we saw, we have school to replacing power school. So we're replacing power school unified. So uh, power school, which is like an ultra megalopoly of a company, uh, uh, as part of Harrison. Harrison uh, had created a management system. It was not great. It was good. It was not great. It could be better. Schoology was better, so Harrison acquired school. And so Schoology has become part of the Harrison Power School ecosystem. Uh, we'll talk about that transition today. Uh, in terms of budget, most orders have gone out, but there are a few last minute orders happening. I do know some departments. Uh, if you're in need of something, uh, just please tell your chair, tell your VP, and I can talk to them. We can arrange any last orders. Uh, and then we've also got some like returning family. So, Back from leave, so we've got Kelly Kubias is back. Yay! Welcome back. Uh, and then we also have the folks who were actually on leave program last year, so I mentioned that Giovanna is back. Um, Deb Quicker and Brian Spencer, who were out at the end of last year, are back now. <laughs> and as many of uh, as many of you probably already heard, we have a new ELA coach from Evelyn Rosario. Uh, we also have a few new team members and student teams to introduce, so some of which we've kind of known for a while and some we haven't. So when I introduce you, we can just kind of stand up. Uh, so Robert, Robert Bogart, who's our, our new uh, ex or our new nurse at the FAC. Uh, we have Edson Martinez, our new general education school coach. So, Rayshana Henderson, I think Rayshana's downstairs. Rayshana is our new social work assistant in the YES program. I believe she's downstairs. <laughs> uh, Melina Mendez, our new special education English teacher. <laughs> and Allison Monaco, our finally appointed. Yay! Yeah! Many, many dudes who are here as a free teacher. Finally, we're going to make it happen. Um, and then we also have student teachers. We have four to start. We may have a fifth starting as an email last night if we can accommodate a clear um, student teacher. Let's talk about ourselves. <laughs> that was at 10 30 last night. We just, just going to do this week. But it's in, we'll talk because it's called Uh But so we may have four, but right now we are officially slated. We're officially slated for four uh, with. Uh, one or two meetings. I don't know where Ken is, Ken is the owner. I can't speak from here. Ken, so we're going to talk about, about, about your student teacher, because I know that was kind of a question mark about it because of the transportation issue. But for our other right student teachers, we definitely have. So we have Kaylee Bryant, who's going to be student teaching with Amy Lawson. Kaylee Fledging, who's going to be student teaching with Angela Crown. Emma Lavinia, who is going to be student teaching with Joe Carnival over the apps. <laughs> and that is not typo. That is our own Elijah Campbell. <laughs> that is our own Elijah Campbell, who will be back here student teaching with Rob. <laughs> 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 so, uh, 
so it's been, guys, an incredibly, incredibly busy, uh, busy summer. Uh, lots of doings. Uh, that is a quick update. I'm sure there is there is more, but like again, I do want to try to get you guys out at, at a reasonable hour. Um, just like last year, I, I think I've officially started like segmenting the new history of Jefferson to be like the pre-COVID era and then the post-COVID era. Like all my friends now who are like who are in the military who are retiring are all like have their like their pre-9/11 career and their post-9/11 career. That's how that's how they look at it. Um, I'm going to go out a little bit in just so we can have this be manageable time. I'm going to go into a little less depth. I'm going to talk about smaller strokes uh, for the report on teaching and learning. But it's just going to help us identify what our priorities are for, for this school year. So, as many of you guys have seen this before, so this is the school district's strategy map for our current five years of teaching plan. I don't know if I'm okay there, but it says, hey, it's 2015 to 2020. Why are we not on a new strategic plan? Hasn't the school district been swimming in free time for the last 18 months to be able to knock out that strategic plan? Ironically, no, it's not happening. However, the RFP has gone out. We are starting a new strategic plan uh, this year for it to be able to start uh, the, uh, for the following year. But these are the goals and the priorities that were set forth for the school system. Uh, I don't know. I have some ideas, I've heard some initial conversations about what the new strategic plan will look like, but again, the reminder is that when one looks at this, even though we are a pre-K to 12 system, uh, is just to note that when we look at things like college preparedness, career readiness, on-time graduation, for every child, a lot of the outcomes under this strategic plan live in high school. Right? Because we are the end of this very, very long 13, 14 year educational pipeline and consequently, a lot of the outcomes associated with any student plan focus a lot on secondary education. So over the course of this plan implementation, we've done a lot of things uh, in order to have ourselves uh, be well positioned and to meet the requirements of work. Probably one of the ones that was most prescient was the fact that we went one-to-one -one, uh, for high schools as a school district so early, because as much of the pain in the neck as it was, uh, seeing last spring my colleagues in other school districts scrounging for laptops and, you know, a family of five getting one Chromebook from the school district and that's what you had to work with. Uh, I will say, normally, our superintendent, normally, fairly nice, happy person, I will say, in, in, over the course of the last 18 months, we have been well served that every single decision she has made has assumed the worst case scenario. Because my Ojeda uh, and, and my last principal, my, I had my first in-person administrative meeting last Wednesday. So the last time I had an in-person meeting was right after our last day, March 16th. We cut the cake for Carmen, did our thing. I ran over his wire, all got a principal's meeting. And my Ojeda absolutely thought, we're going to have two weeks. Maybe, maybe it's going to stretch into the spring break. And then we're back by the and normally, I also try to plan for the worst case scenario, but I was absolutely deluded. <laughs> and I really thought that it was not going to be this long of a closure. On, I was, on March 16th, all of you were told me straight up, she said, I don't think we're coming back for a while. She's like, we're lucky for September. Which all the principals were like, no way. How bad can it be? It's like the flu. <laughs> Little did we know. So I will say, a lot of the work that went into this strategic plan uh, did position us not to say that everything during COVID was smooth or easy. However, uh, we were certainly better positioned than many other organizations, especially other large school districts in New Jersey, in order to be able to meet the needs of students during that time. I will say, if if noted by nothing else, that over the last over the last year and 10 years, it dropped 20,000 students from either kids leaving the charter schools or kids leaving the town. We are like building new schools like gangbusters. I will say, I don't know how many of you read the minutes I post, like, we did just acquire the Benedictine Academy. So we are, so we are opening the new STEM Academy, uh, which I, I know I feel that I have to learn this name. The new STEM Academy has a name, the JBJ STEM Academy. Our friend Ted Panagopoulos, formerly a student here, is the principal. 
at, at Livingston Academy. And it, it, it's called the JBJ Academy because it's named for the three computer scientists who are hidden figures. And I only remember Catherine Johnson because I kind of think like she's the most famous. But I know there's the other two, and I really have to remember, I really have to know those two other names. But for sure, because it's kind of a long name, they've just been calling it the JBJ STEM Academy. We have now acquired Benedictine. Uh, that is an incredibly small building, but for sure, for sure, we could use more high school space. I will tell you, we are opening that new STEM Academy, and no high school enrollment is changed. All that, all that high school did was accommodate the increase we all would have had. But you would think opening this many new schools at this time of a flip, enrollments into high school would be going down. Uh, but a large, you know, a large factor of that is that in the, the lack of charters is because generally the community is very satisfied with what the school district is doing. So the major themes of that last strategic plan are kind of summarized in that promise statement. So it's got two parts. First is to provide an innovative and personalized learning environment. And the second is about ensuring that we're child achieving excellence. That's the equity part uh, of that promise statement. And so a lot of the work that we've done, like one-to-one -one and literacy across disciplines, uh, the step success model, all that kind of stuff, all kind of fell under these two different priorities. And that being said, that's how we got to last year's problem time. Right, which we led every faculty meeting. We would focus on the revised curriculum that we had to work with during the pandemic, and also focus on how we could leverage these key factors like those new curricula, positive relationships, BST, all these different elements in order to elicit high levels of student learning. So once we did that, right, we've used this slide before, right, as we implemented. We were looking at um, what approaches were yielding the best results, especially last year over the course of our first three to four months. Uh, that's when we did, uh, we did the school-wide adoption of Nearpod, we were able to do a school-wide adoption for Mind, uh, implementing some new uh, digital technologies, vocabulary, uh, buying some new equipment for teachers. Uh, we did, basically, we were just tinkering with our, with our instructional model to figure out what was going to be able to help connect us with our goals. And these were last year's instructional priorities, right? We started around with being, just being highly intentional with everything we did and focusing effectively, behaviorally, and cognitively. Now, I will tell you, that model um, resulted in us being not only the only high school, the only school in all of Elizabeth that actually improved in every school district metric last year. So that's attendance, benchmark, every, every area. Um, we got a shout out from the Title I office, because we're going to Title I school in the region that actually that had improvements during the pandemic. And of course, then the question, uh, the, original, the, the original thought would have been, now, if we were doing the same thing that other schools were doing, then theoretically right, every school would have seen the, the same kind of improvement. That was not the case. I will say, although I do feel like a lot of that improvement had to do with some of those uh, some of those uh, changes that we implemented last year and some of those new technologies, I will tell you when it comes to the attendance. And attendance is always it is it is my the reason I look at it so much, guys is because it is my favorite proxy for engagement. It's also my favorite proxy for instruction, when using it as a vendor, is not only is it a great proxy for engagement and, and great proxy for instruction, but I get feedback on it 180 days a year, eight to nine times a day. So it's one of our favorite metrics that we look at, and I, I totally attribute it. Uh, the increases in attendance last year, which were the only provision high school actually ever had like above 95% attendance. Uh, I actually attribute it to us as a faculty really staying connected with kids during the spring of 2020. Like during that super crazy rough patch of like March to June 2020. When again, much of what the district did was 
An emergency set of conditions, but it was necessary, like they were giving, we were giving them a ton of A's, when normally there would not have been the grades that were merited. Uh, but I would say, uh, the fact that the faculty that we were able to stay connected with so many students was absolutely evident in the data at the time. Because actually most of the schools caught up to us by like February and March. But in several, especially in our high school, these kind of incredible. Ever want to repeat last year ever again? But last year, which on paper will look like one of the greatest, most stellar years in the history of Jefferson. And that is because, as we discussed kind of last year in one of our later faculty meetings, is the degree to which we observe trauma, loss, and other factors impacting students' social emotional well being absolutely created a, a um, uh, learning plan in many cases. We would have stood it regardless, but none of us would ever want to live through that again. And I'll, I'll not replay all the more details, but there's been an incredible amount of loss across the community. The flood did not help, but certainly coming after a year and a half of COVID, uh, certainly a lot of our families have been through an incredible amount. So last year, some of you remember this image, so I mean, last year I worked with a, a small student advisory group who uh, met with me twice a week to discuss issues of student social emotional well-being. We created this image as like a composite of like all these things that kids thought were kind of coming at them and were critical during uh, during COVID, like the quality of their sleep, self-care, the impact of social media, craziness of doing college applications by themselves. Every single one of these things falling out of the overflowing book bag, like anxiety and stress, all of them were topics that came up frequently in our discussions. Uh, and I say that because it's something we're going to certainly what is actually happening with a kid. And that is of concern. I will tell you, one of the one of the students in this advisory group, I have a very friendly relationship with him. He came to every meeting. We would be in groups for two hours a week. I met with him privately for two hours after. He never brought up the fact that his mother passed away from COVID. I know his mother passed away from COVID because his dad called him. And I know, and we and, and talked to the teacher when he was a freshman. But literally, it, he never brought it up. If I, if I didn't, if his dad had called me, I could possibly have never known. He would talk about, oh yeah, well, there's loss, and there's this, and there's that. Never brought, and this is a girl pretty comfortable. Uh, but that's just emblematic. I mean, multiply back to these three factors and these three principles to kind of guide a lot of what we do over the course of the year. First and foremost is structure. Children need it. They fail to thrive when they don't have it. And for many, many students, especially in a place like Elizabeth, especially if you're, if you're in a community that you know, a wealth community or an urbanist or whatever you want to call it, many, many, many students rely on us for an incredible amount of their stuff. Right. Many of our students we could describe as being very school dependent. Right? They rely on us for a lot of resources. Some of them rely on, I mean, they rely on us certainly for educational resources, sometimes for social capital. Right? That's why so many deaf kids graduate want to be teachers. Right? Because it's like, well, that's who they know. Right? That's who, that's why they know that is. But you know, teacher, you know, nurse, doctor, you know, police officer, fireman, you know these other institutional traffic that you've come to rely on on your life. So structure and the degree to which many students have not had it and the degree to which we are going to offer it uh, is, is going to be an important part of this year. And I, and I, I say this lovingly because the one thing that I do often have to remind you, I think I remember discussing this with Erica when we were doing, um, we tell the story when we were doing the show, which is the reality is, guys, because there are going to be times when kids are not going to like it. As much as they need it, they may not like it. Because there's one thing I know in the principle, it is that structure does not emerge organically. Structure must be imposed. The only way. So there are going to be times when they will not like their medicine, but I assure you, anything we do is going to be for their benefit. 
So I'm not the next couple of years, <laughs> but I can see that they needed it. But it is important that we do that we do focus on it. That said, at the same time, because it came up a lot in my in that social uh, about social emotional well-being work group, uh, empathy has to balance structure, and that is finding opportunities in class and across the school, the relationships with students to to listen to them. Uh, and that was actually kind of one of the things that I liked about my advisory is it's kind of one of the only opportunities I got this during COVID when I'm not in the building with kids where I could actually have a dialogue with a kid. Because when you really think about it, you realize you may not spend a lot of time listening and talking to each other, especially in that virtual environment. So that helps the balance structure and then keeping our commitment to engagement. Right? I will tell you, as long as we focus on on that academic, behavioral, cognitive behavior, whatever it is, any of those three, the educational outcomes will be there. So long as we change engagement. That's actually, there's an old story that like George Foreman, uh, when he was a young boxer, um, would, uh, his, he would work with coaches because he, he felt he was too slow. Right? He moved too slowly. And he, they said, listen, what you've got to do is you've got to focus on just like, just, just be fast. Don't worry about like trying to get hard. Just try to be fast. And George Foreman, or Foreman, he says like, listen, uh, but like I don't want to lose my power. You know, that's kind of that's kind of a thing. So I don't want to just go fast just for the sake of going fast. And his coach told him, bro, you're George Foreman. If you hit someone, it's not going to tickle. So in the same way, he's like, he's like, believe me, if you throw if you throw punch fast. Believe me, the power will be there. <laughs> I assure you, they will feel it. Um, if you target engagement, the outcomes, the benchmark scores, all that stuff, it will be there. So these are going to be the priorities for the year. Uh, obviously, one of the main structures we're going to focus on for this year are the COVID protocols. Uh, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, the reason for that is because not only, obviously, do we still operate during the pandemic? Because the pandemic is not yet over. But at the same time, we must, it is absolutely critical to send a clear message to the community that school is a safe place. So I will prepare you now. I hope it doesn't happen here. But I will tell you, sometime in the next two weeks, I'm calling it, there will be a picture that goes viral of students in an Elizabeth school but all bunched up in one location not wearing masks. And that picture will be shared 80 million times across the entire community with you know captions like you see, we knew it, uh, you know, this is not safe. And it is critical that parents who, who need to like work and do other things besides stay home with their children. Uh, or Let's be honest, sometimes we rely on our students, their oldest children, to watch their younger children. Uh, it is critical that they know that when they put their kid out the door in the morning and they're coming here, that they're going to a place that is safe. And overwhelmingly, what we have found just from now 18 months of studying this is that it can be done safely. I'm not going to say there's no chance this year of a shutdown. Right. Actually, I'm going to talk about this here because of our region, because right now, Union County is still in the orange for um, moderate risk because of the number of cases across the county. That's actually why some of these practices are in place. So we're going to have to pause for a second. If whatever reason, if your mask has come down, just a reminder. And you, we're going to all learn to do this in class, especially either A, B, wearing the mask, or, or B, more likely wearing it properly. Because a lot of kids get accustomed to wearing it well around the mouth, I get it, it's uncomfortable. But we do want to make sure that we have effective fidelity and protocols so that students and parents and us can all feel safe when we are in school. And I was saying, please note that the majority of the protocols that exist in schools are much, much, much more about keeping adults safe than kids. Kids overwhelmingly are fine. Like for the most part, even with the Delta variant, compared to us, <laughs> compared to like the adults who are in the room with the kids, the majority of the protocol exists for our safety, not for them. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. We're also going to talk about other instructional approaches we're going to use, 
like using binders and building note taking, which we had started two years ago, which we're going to come back to in order to help students stay organized. Uh, we're going to look at revisiting school and classroom procedures and structures for collaboration. When it comes to empathy, we'll, we'll talk briefly about multi tier services and self care for teachers. Okay, and, and I'll highlight that one over the course of a year this importance of teachers taking care of themselves and making sure that not only are you monitoring your health, but also like your level of anxiety or stress. And one of my, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, Vince Lombardi said, he said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Like, fatigue is like pain. Like, it'll make you do things that you would never normally do because you're tired. So we want to make sure that if we're able to show up for kids, we have to be able to take care of ourselves as well. Uh, and then when it comes to engagement, we'll talk a little about Schoology uh, and uh, about different learning platforms we're going to be using, carrying over from last year, to try to, now that we're going to be in person, build in and you can leverage these digital tools for our benefit, and I'll say at the same time, potentially explore ways of teaching that require us to not talk that much. Because this gets old. When, you, especially if you have a block, uh, or you're teaching somewhat unavoidably at three classes, three or four classes, three, this will get fired. And so, finding some strategies to, to help along that route will, will be a big help. So, we're going to start with COVID precautions because I know a lot of folks have questions about it. So, uh, and this comes obviously from our, our state department of health, our local department of health, our superintendent, our local county superintendent. The overwhelming goal of all of the COVID precautions that we're putting in place are first, effective continuity of instruction. And we want to have, the, we want to have as, as minimal as possible have students end up going to school during COVID and miss out on things. We want to reduce to the greatest extent possible what they would miss out on by having one lottery of births and being a teenager during the era of COVID. And we want to make sure that our school is safe. Now, I will say, last week when we were in our my first administrative meeting in a year, uh, I was with uh, Marie Unit, who is our school nurse coordinator, and we did get a shout out. She came, actually she came to me personally, and she said, "She's like, Mike, it's wonderful, you know, this is in her first year as a nurse coordinator." And she's like, "So believe me, she's like, it was not easy working with some teachers and some others." Like when she's trying to be a person who helps. So she was very appreciative that her interactions with our faculty were very effective and very positive. Uh, so I know that a lot of this is going to be able to be managed. I'm going to go through these precautions and uh, I'm going to share also that this summary book, the 2122 guidebook, lays out for parents and teachers all the COVID precautions. One of the items I'm going to ask everyone to do today, because you're going to be signing off on it at the end of the day, is to have read through this guide. Pretty cool. the most critical parts. Uh, so we're going to make sure we're going to, I'm going to go through this information. I'm going to ask everyone at the end of the day to have read the guidebook, and then again we'll do that Q and A once I get through these procedures. So everything starts with the ever so popular staff vaccination mandate and or testing mandate. Now I will say. New Jersey, I think, was much more fair, not like the Washington model. Uh, New Jersey went the way to California. The Washington model was that you get tested, you 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 were vaccinated by mid-October, or you were terminated. That's it. At the end of the conversation. Uh, that's a little extreme because there are going to be circumstances under which some folks can get vaccinated, up to and including you may have had COVID in the last three months. So there's a there's a number of different circumstances. So what our procedure is going to be. Is Alters is the same uh, company that we use for the daily COVID checklist that you guys were all doing last year. Same company. They are creating a custom survey for us that is going to allow all of us, if we are vaccinated, to upload. And I have no objection. I know, generally speaking, when folks here got COVID, they usually call me first, which I think you're always welcome to do that. But you're going to notice that sometimes a lot of the procedures are called the nurse. Right, and, that, and that's that's because they have they're they are held to a standard of confidentiality that even school principal or not. That said, obviously anything you tell me, I can go by its principles. But there's a reason that this procedure is being implemented because 
I am not personally collecting back to me. So uh, that will be time sensitive because I, I was told originally that survey was to have been ready today. I'll check my email when we go on break, but I've not seen it yet. But I do know that, that they have told us when that survey comes out, they're going to want the data in 24 hours. This is about boosters. They're going to watch what vaccination you got, what what is on the vaccination card. Now, for the unvaccinated, uh, they'll participate in weekly nasal swab testing. Now, uh, I will say right now, because it's been a contentious issue, been unclear. Uh, well, it's been unclear in the future who will pay for these tests for the unvaccinated. As of right now, the school district is paying because the federal government is reimbursing every cent for all these COVID tests. I do not know when that will end. I don't know how long that will go on. I know for as long as the federal government is subsidizing it, they're happy to do it. Um, that's actually not the only thing we're getting. Just a side note, school lunch and breakfast this year for every student in Elizabeth is free. No, every, there is, there, every single student in Elizabeth is a free one student this year uh, because of COVID conditions. So um, for right now, I do know we have already been told most insurance providers, including ours, will not cover it when that moment comes. Being reimbursed by the federal government. When we get this survey data, that's going to have this. That's going to have help the school district decide the the uh, the COVID testing, the weekly COVID testing, or it will be regional. So, for example, if we end up with three unvaccinated team members here, five unvaccinated team members next door, two at Dwyer, one at Halsey, they might just say, okay, everyone go to the Dwyer nurse's office. We're going to have one location. The numbers and where they are in the school district, that's how they're going to decide uh, where the testing will be. Uh, they've, been, they've been talking about Tuesday afternoons as, as the date, but that's not confirmed yet. It could be Monday afternoons. They did confirm, however, the testing is definitely after work. And so the testing that's being done for the school district will be site based or regional. It'll be after work hours. And again, because of HIPAA, all that the school district receives is notice if, if you're vaccinated and you go there. We get notice if you went. We don't we don't get your results. Your results are if, if whether positive or negative come from a public health nurse who contacts you. And in which case, if let's say someone is a positive, you end up having, you, you could call me obviously, but generally the procedure is you would call the school nurse and you would inform the school nurse. And the school nurse just comes to me and tells me the substance will be out for X number of weeks. Uh, but uh, the district only receives attendance data. Consequently, and I will tell you our, our good friend, Mr. Cuesta, who is not only a former principal here, but a former student here, who has a lot of love for Jefferson. Uh, Mr. Cuesta has been getting a lot of questions about about the testing, he was very emphatic to me that if a if a team member was present at work on a given day, so it's on Tuesday, you're unvaccinated, and you're at work on that Tuesday, and after school there's testing, and you don't go, you are automatically on leave. And whenever when we can arrange it, so if you have questions, we'll just do all the questions when we get to the Q and A. Now. Most common scenario is if a class has a case. And all this, guys, is, is in much better detail in the guidebook, but this is what you need to know. So if there's a case of COVID in a classroom, uh, in this case, um, the room obviously gets to be cleaning that day. Uh, can return, so there is no quarantine for students, regardless of vaccination status. There is no quarantine so long as students are three feet apart in your class or room. So, now, that's why actually one of